Seen from above, the Yasuni National Park stretches as far as the eye can see. One million hectares of the Amazon basin with a biodiversity unique in the world. It's a sanctuary for indigenous peoples. This vast green area conceals Ecuador's largest oil reserves. For the first time in mankind's history, a poor country that depends on oil for its survival has thrown down a challenge to the rest of the world to not exploit its main source of wealth so that the lungs of the planet may be preserved and to enter the age of renewable energy. This story began three years ago in Ecuador when Rafael Correa came to power. He's president for change, left wing and an ecologist. Just after his election, he condemned the damage caused by oil companies. Incredible. This really is savage capitalism. In Ecuador, the Amazon forest has almost disappeared because of oil exploitation. But even so, it seems unrealistic not to exploit Yasuni. Without the money from oil, the country would be bankrupt. This resource lies in the ITT block, the future exploitation zone named after the three oil fields, Ishpingo, Tambacocha and Tiputini. Relinquishing the Yasuni oil reserves means giving up $7 billion. Rafael Correa can only succeed with the help of the international community. He proposes a deal to the UN, where both North and South would gain. We are prepared to make this huge sacrifice, but we are asking for the participation of the international community particularly the developed countries who are the main polluters of the planet. We ask them to participate by means of a minimal financial compensation for the ecological benefits generated through the proposal. This would be an extraordinary example of collective world action leading to a reduction in global warming for the benefit of all. It would also be the start of a new system of economic thinking for the 21st century, where the creation of value is financially rewarded and not just the creation of goods. Thank you very much. Currently, the market economy places value on the creation of goods. If I want to buy a tractor in the United States, I must pay for it or I won't be able to use it or benefit from it. But if the Americans want to breathe the clean air from the Amazon, they don't have to compensate us. In economics, that's called an open access resource. It's a resource that has a value, but no exchange value, no price. And yet this resource surely has the highest value on the planet, because without this clean air, without the Amazon, there would be no life on the planet. The president calls on four public figures to bring this idea to life. Yolanda Kakabatsa, former environment minister. Carlos Larea, doctor of economics. Francisco Carrion, former foreign minister. And Roque Sevilla, former mayor of Quito. He's a businessman and a committed ecologist, and he heads the team. It's a very difficult challenge. We have to play this utopian idea and these completely new concepts, transform them into reality. The idea is launched. Now all the details have to be worked out. The legal framework, the guarantees, but also the key element, the financial compensation. In addition to donations and grants, Rock is counting on selling carbon bonds. He's convinced it's the most effective way of raising substantial funds. How will it work? We have to explain to them that basically these carbon bonds will end up in the hands of the countries that help us. And we must emphasize at the start of every meeting that what we are proposing is not part of the Kyoto Protocol. In Europe, countries that have signed up to the Kyoto Protocol must honor a CO2 quota. Those countries that exceed their quota must buy carbon bonds from the organizations that have reduced their emissions. Under this system, CO2 cuts are rewarded financially. Ecuador is proposing to broaden the scheme so that non-emitted CO2, which will stay underground in Yasuni, 
can be exchanged in the market for carbon bonds. Their plan is ready. Now they have to persuade the rest of the world that their idea is viable. It's vital. Without compensation, the president won't be able to afford to leave the oil underground. They start their campaign in Germany. It will be difficult. They're arriving in the middle of the financial crisis. But Germany is the leader in the fight against global warming. The German Greens were the first to pick up on this idea. Thanks to them, the Ecuadorians have an appointment today in Parliament. Hello. What are we actually asking for? What we're asking is very difficult, we know. We're asking that you allow this proposal, which may seem a bit crazy, to function, and for these papers, these certificates, to have a similar value to carbon bonds. And most importantly, that regulation of these bonds will allow industry to buy them. In brief, that's our initiative. Now I'll stop talking so that you can ask questions. After this presentation, I must tell you that you have succeeded, with our support, in starting something exceptional. This is a revolution, and for it to work, it must be well prepared. Unfortunately, I can't answer the questions about the new carbon bonds now. but we are prepared to send experts to study your proposal. Thank you very much. When you bring us the answers to these questions, a first payment may be considered, which is certainly a motivation both for you and for us. Thank you very much for coming. This idea to send a letter to the other parliaments of the UA it's great. Yeah, you can do it. Yes, that yes, will be yes, a great help. Yes, yes, yes. No, I'm thinking, yes. Please, you my, can implement. My from the SPD, from the other countries. If you can so, if yeah, you no, implement that, I would like to give you a copy of the presentation. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's in German, in Spanish, and English. Thank you very much. Okay? <laughs> thank you. Minister of Environment. In the Bundestag, a first battle has been won. Now another one must be won with public opinion and the media, essential for putting pressure on governments. Very good question. With the money that we're getting, that will go to a trust fund, and that trust fund will be, of course, the government of Ecuador mm. and the governments of the countries who are supporting the, the idea. So there is a control. But we're using this swap system of projects that are already before... Um, discussed and accepted mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I was just saying it would be much easier just to exploit oil and yeah. not to ask anybody and not mm. to to make conditions here mm. everything is conditioned mm. it's a very bold project for the future it's a response to the responsibility we feel towards future generations the support of public opinion in the countries that contribute funds and also public opinion in Ecuador is really fundamental. Our civilization is in a state of collapse and in order to prevent it we're trying to place a value on nature. We think it's the only way to prevent this collapse. With this idea, we want countries to make a moral and ethical contribution in order to find a balance between the three major problems of our time, which are climate change, the destruction of biodiversity, and poverty and inequality. What I like most is the fact that Ecuador is the initiator of such an innovative and different proposal. 
which will be useful to other countries. So, Mr. State Secretary, please meet uh, the Minister for Environment and the members of the delegation. After obtaining the support of the German parliament, Roxavia must now convince the government. It will decide whether to finance the initiative or not. It's a very important meeting. The product, if we can call it that, that we would put on the market would be these tons of CO2 that we won't have emitted. Our central idea is to issue something like carbon bonds. We have called them the SUNY Guarantee Certificates. What we're actually asking Europe to do is to recognize these Yasuni guarantee certificates as if they were carbon bonds. So, you have defined a price for not exploiting the oil. And for you it comes to the same thing if we give you this money with or without the certificates, doesn't it? That means that the result is the same. So, I really don't see why you've come up with such a complicated system. I suppose you thought it was attractive for governments, psychologically attractive, but in reality, it isn't. Because of the crisis we're going through, European countries aren't receiving so much money from taxpayers. In that context, it's hard to use people's taxes to pay for a project like ours. And that's why we thought of financing the project via the market. If you are prepared to fund it directly, that's even better. I don't want to criticize, but if I can offer you some advice, you should present different arguments to the other governments. If I were you, I wouldn't launch the campaign until your plan is clearer. The German minister is right. In other European capitals, the criticisms are the same, concerning the carbon market, but also the guarantees. How can they be sure the oil won't be exploited? What if there's a change of president? In short, is Ecuador credible? My second question is about the stability of your country. How could political instability in Ecuador affect this initiative? Your question about instability is quite legitimate. For more than 15 years, Ecuador was in a period of institutional crisis. But now at last we have a stable government. President Correa and his government have a strong and well-supported leadership. So what will happen in 10 years? It's hard to know, but our intention is for the oil to stay underground forever. What happens if we extract the oil? They'll take the capital back from us. We will only use the interest. The guarantee is the capital. If we ever fail to keep our word, then this trust fund will return the money to the people who gave it to us. If you had seen this place 40 years ago and compared it to what you see now, it's really sad. On the other hand, you say to yourself, if there wasn't a project like ours, how could you protect this forest? It's hard to persuade people because they say to us, wait for the next technical meeting on the Kyoto Protocol. But in five years, there will be nothing left here to protect. In Madrid, Francisco Carrion arrives in friendly territory. He was ambassador there and made an excellent impression. He's almost certain he'll get results. But he comes across a problem which Spain isn't the only country to raise. Your project can count on the complete support of the government. Now, if we can have an open and honest conversation, 
I think I have to tell you which points really cause us problems. It's hard to make a decision when you think of how people might try and replicate it. There will be several elements, several factors. We're aware that if Saudi Arabia asked for the same thing tomorrow, it would become completely unmanageable. We're talking about an area of great biodiversity, which is certainly not the case with Saudi Arabia. It's a part of the planet where there are forests and where deforestation can be avoided. That's fundamental. And then the oil. No, I really think we're talking about a case which would be hard to replicate. Hmm. Do you know Juan de Hierro? He's one of my associates, an expert on orchids. What did you see? When you travel like this, you think that everything's the same. It's all green. But in fact, reliable scientific studies have shown that this place has one of the richest biodiversities in the world. Each hectare contains over 650 species of trees. In fact, in all of North America, Alaska, Canada, the United States and Mexico, there are only 1,000 species of trees. Do you realize how much diversity there is? Can you see it all? It's impressive. Certain plants, certain insects, certain amphibians contain extraordinary chemical substances. It may be that these chemicals could be very important for industry or medicine. We remove the skin and then we use the seed. Is that what you call curare? It's also very important to preserve the cultures of the people that live here, because they've always lived in a very close relationship with the forest. They know all these chemicals and use them as medicines. If we develop the oil exploitation here even more, we will destroy all these riches. The Indians under threat from the exploitation are the Huwa Urani. Two of their communities live hidden in the heart of Yasuni, refusing all contact with the outside world. They will be condemned to death if the ITT block is exploited. They're the last survivors of a long list of peoples sacrificed at the altar of oil. I wanted to give you this important message because we want the whole world to listen to us and to let us live in peace. We know what will harm our forest, I should say our home, because the forest is our home. I know that the country needs oil, but those of us who live in our home are very worried. We have already suffered a lot. If they come and exploit this land, it's certain we will die. The real difficulty comes from Quito. At the end of 2008, Rafael Correa is torn between the necessity to fill the country's coffers and the desire to keep to his commitment concerning Yasuni. 
No nos engañemos. Para un país pobre como There's no hiding from it. For a poor country like Ecuador, giving up oil is too great a sacrifice if there's no compensation. Un sacrificio demasiado grande, sin compensaciones. The oil companies are pressuring the government to exploit Yasuni, including the national company Petro Ecuador. Correa yields to the pressure and gives the go-ahead to Petro Ecuador to prepare the exploitation. Previous governments had already started to carve up the park. Three companies are already established, Petro Oriental, Petro Ecuador and Repsol. The oil feast isn't yet over. Reversing the course of history will be difficult. We know that we must go beyond the extractivist model. We know that we must protect nature, but we have to watch out for a certain aspect of ecology. Very often the northern countries demand that southern countries do what they haven't done, i.e. protect nature. But in poor countries, for environmental protection to be viable, it must create wealth to improve our population's standard of living. Del nivel de vida de nuestra gente. He decrees that he will wait no longer than the 31st of December to obtain compensation. Correa, the idealist, is becoming a realist. This cutoff date is seen in Europe as an ultimatum. Rafael Correa isn't making his envoy's task any easier. Quite the opposite. Forced into a corner, they must redouble their efforts. You have the support of the Senate and my commitment. What's important when we're in front of the president is to have support. We need firm indications of support. As chair of the Environment Committee, it seems to be a really important and unique initiative which merits our total support at every institutional level. It's essential that we have these letters by mid-December, because then we can go to the president and say, look, we've got the support from the mayor of Rome, of Madrid. It's very important that he sees we have institutional support, and we can get it very fast. With these letters, we will have more room to maneuver with the president. Don't worry. San Francisco de Oriana is the main town outside Yasuni. It's a strategic town for the pro and anti oil campaigners. The president has set the two sides against each other. Yolanda goes to defend the Yasuni initiative against her opponents. I'm worried about this meeting, as it's the first time we've presented our project in the Amazon. We must take care not to raise expectations too high, even if we believe that we'll succeed. We don't have anything certain yet. If we create too many expectations and we fail, that would be dangerous for everyone, especially for the people of Ecuador. Here politicians have always made promises and either they haven't kept them or they have failed. We'll see how it goes today. We're going to the auditorium. I don't know where it is yet. This is the town hall. Yolanda is right to be worried. Her opponents have wasted no time since they received the president's go-ahead. It's a natural resource in a protected area. I'm going to talk to you about our ITT project. At the start of exploitation, we will establish three platforms, one, two, and three. In the northern area, we'll develop the oil field at Ispingo at a later stage. I really want to emphasize that, at the moment, I and the other members of the Yasuni Commission can't guarantee that it's going to work because we don't have a partner who's prepared to pay to leave the oil underground. But when we do have one, obviously we will be the first to come and tell you that, yes, this is going to work. 
Then we can work together to decide how to develop the Amazon. There is a possibility that Mrs. Kakabat's wish will not come about. So we at Petro Ecuador are obliged to have an alternative. That's why we wanted to tell you that we're working in case this initiative doesn't succeed. Does anyone have any further questions? I thought I was going to hear about the Yasuni ITT initiative to leave the oil underground, but this has been a public presentation on the ITT exploitation. The spokesman from Petro Ecuador talked about safety standards, but the only thing you've done since oil exploitation began here is really to destroy the Amazon, and you're going to continue. It's a very fragile place. You'll destroy everything, not only the forest, but people's lives as well, if you continue with these irresponsible methods that don't consider the health of the people. There can't be two proposals, one for protection and one for exploitation. There must be only one, if there truly is an intention to protect Yasuni. Our organization is proposing the only valid option, the protection of Yasuni as a World Heritage Site. We will resist. We will call on others to resist. Gradually, I've realized that the guarantee is political. If the government wanted to exploit the area, there would be opposition in the streets. Only a month before the ultimatum runs out, the president's envoys go to Norway. Norway, whose wealth is based on oil, has just launched a global program to save tropical forests. The idea is to fight against global warming by reducing deforestation. The funds released are considerable, and therefore, Rock thinks there's a chance of some financing. Good morning, I see your picture in the paper. <laughs> so, what desperates us is the timing. In, in some things, you can wait. But in biodiversity, you can't wait. Biodiversity goes away and it's away, and that's it. And that is why we are uh, pushing this idea of a pilot project. I think that the first thing is, of course, that we are, as you were, keenly interested in forest protection. And uh, the, the starting point and the, the link to this being paid for not ex exploiting your oil resources is not the angle from which we would come looking at your project. And I think in that context, it's good for you to be aware that the Amazonas program that we are supporting with Brazil has quite a substantial amount of money. And therefore, we would support and encourage that Ecuador uh, is active towards the Amazonas program. And uh, we can facilitate that contact and, and the possibilities that are there for you in that. I think that is the, the approach that we are looking for. I'm really very disappointed, very unhappy. I think we can leave the basis for future discussion here and keep in contact, but I believe we really must try to get our project through as we have planned it. I know we'll get there. We have to fight. You have to realize that Norway is also an oil-producing country, 
and there's a conflict between the protection of nature and oil exploitation as there is in Ecuador. Obviously, if they support the Ecuadorian project to leave the oil underground in order to protect nature, they have to be consistent and do the same at home. After the failure in Oslo, Washington is the last leg. A wind of hope is blowing over the American capital. Obama has just been elected and promises to get involved in the question of climate change. What change will they see? What progress will we have made? This is our chance to answer that call. Yolanda and Rock are pinning their hopes for the future on the USA, especially as the idea of selling carbon bonds to finance the project hasn't worked in Europe. We've given up on the idea of carbon trading in Europe. The market is too strictly regulated. It will be very difficult to get them to make an exception for this project. But in the US, there isn't yet a carbon market. So we're proposing the possibility for countries that qualify as Yasuni countries to place carbon bonds directly onto the American market. We also expect that the US gets into the Kyoto Protocol. And if that happens, you're going to need a lot of certificates. And maybe uh, to buy one uh, thousandths of, uh, of, of uh, the investment in certificates like the one of the Yasuni. Sorry to make this question, Roque and, and Yolanda, but uh, the question for me is what happens if this doesn't fly? Uh, we are still worried about the Yasuni and we're still worried about the, the communities and we're still worried about the biodiversity that, that is there. And uh, do you have a plan B for all this? Well, the plan B is to exploit the oil. I think that's the reality. If, uh, if a country has tried to develop a different idea and this idea just doesn't fit in the international community, uh, then you go back to what everybody's doing. If you find oil, you exploit it and you use it. The fate of the Yasuni ITT initiative is hanging by a thread. Rock and the other members of the commission are back in Quito. They want to carry on. They're convinced they can succeed. Germany and Spain are going to send experts to assist them. It's not certain it will be enough to persuade the president. Ecuador has been devastated by the global crisis. The state coffers are empty. This is no time for romanticism. Korea sends a strong signal to the oil industry. To believe that you can emerge from an oil-dependent economy by closing oil fields, I'm sorry, but it's just a bit too ridiculous. I'm sorry to put it so bluntly. To leave an extractive economy means using oil to develop other sectors, like tourism, agriculture, services, so that this particular sector loses importance in the total economy of the country. But until we get to that point, and even once we get there, when we've developed other sectors, we'll have to use these non-renewable resources as effectively as possible. We can't allow ourselves to be beggars while we're sitting on a pile of gold. In Quito, Roxavier is still waiting to be seen. He hasn't given up. He's hoping for a chance to persuade the president. He could call me tomorrow to tell me to come. I'm worried that... You must tell him option A. We preserve you Sunni. Option B, we exploit the oil. Let's compare A and B and see which is the best. I think that, given the president's personality, we should present plan A and, I'd say, arouse his desire to break with established systems, arouse his revolutionary side. And you must tell him that we're sure that we'll succeed precisely because it's revolutionary. 
That's how you must put it to him. You must put forward the four points that we've written on the board. You must give him figures. He loves figures. He'll ask questions. If he asks lots of questions, it means he's interested. It doesn't mean he disagrees. He'll question you to see if what you say holds water. That's the way he works. If he shows no interest, it's bad. Yeah. It was a hard battle. The time limit for finding economic compensation required by the government had expired, and we hadn't obtained the compensation. Also, the Minister for Energy made it clear he wanted to exploit the oil fields. In fact, it was a silent battle between those who wanted to continue with this amazing and innovative effort and those who wanted to do what they've always done, to exploit the oil because that's where the wealth lies. But we are placing a much higher value on other elements. And that requires a change of mindset for every one of us. That was the battle. The battle takes place in the presidential palace behind closed doors, between Rock and the president. We've been through a time of despondency, but the team's enthusiasm is so great. They said, Mr. President, please give us another chance because this initiative has such enormous potential. I think it does too. So in the end, I've been unusually flexible and I've extended the time limit and I really think, I hope, this initiative will be successful. At last, the initiative starts again. The promised experts come to join Rock's team. Their aim is clear, to propose a credible plan and obtain a first payment. The problem is the amount of the compensation. We have a mandate from the government. The mandate from the government is very clear. If you can't manage to find an equivalent compensation, we will exploit the oil. But that's the problem. On the one hand, Europe tells us that the carbon market can't accept our proposals because it doesn't come within the rules. And on the other hand, our government says, if you want your initiative, give us an equivalent compensation. The question is whether your initiative is realistic. I think where you need to build strength is to persuade the government that, that this is going to go downhill in any case, oil exploration, because the world is changing. The world is changing and therefore the government needs to be interested themselves in wanting to change. If the government doesn't want to change, this is never going to happen. This has to be clear for each of you. The government is not clear, because there are two movements internally. People who support us, of course, and then the people who want to extract the oil. I haven't worked with you for very long, but this it all seems very rushed to me. I was told, if we haven't got the money by this date, we stop everything and exploit the oil. I don't know if it's very sensible, diplomatically and politically, to say that to the countries who are supposed to invest. And is it sensible to ask them for so much money? I'm very pleased by what has just happened. Because I thought it would happen. In fact, all of you are saying, please be realistic. You're right. I think that too. I tell myself that the easiest thing would be to be realistic. I know that there's an option B, an option C, an option D. But we're working on option A. If, thanks to the mental effort from all of you, we can produce a new proposal to present in Europe, 
we must be prepared for the Europeans to say, why should we give you so much money? For what reason? Rock, can I say something? I'm a European, and the Europeans are environmentalists at heart. The problem is the economic compensation, especially as the crisis is making things difficult for them. The discussion shouldn't be about this economic compensation. If we want to win over the international community, we first of all have to really get the national government on board. Then you can present this as an innovative model that breaks with existing systems, a romantic, in inverted commas, model. We're a developing country, it's a new model. With the leaders and everyone is behind us, it's possible. The economic circumstances aren't favorable, but the ideological circumstances are. The wealthy countries have recognized that they need the small countries, make the most of it. That's a great way to finish, Olga. What does compensation actually mean? It can sound like blackmail. That's why it's the weakest part of the project, and we've been working on it for eight months. How can we construct this proposal so that it is received as a proposal for shared responsibility and not as a proposal where Ecuador says, I'm doing nothing more than leaving the oil underground and you will pay me? To show the strength of its commitment, Ecuador accepts that the compensation should be equal to only 50% of the price of the oil. That is $3.5 billion. In April 2009, Rafael Correa is re-elected as president in the first round. That has never happened before in this young democracy. His investiture speech gives hope to the Yusuni team. We are driven by a feeling of justice, of creativity, and we have developed initiatives like Yusuni ITT. We are continuing to support this initiative and we plan to create a precedent which can change history. Rock and his team arrive in London in June. With support from Prince Charles, they're sure they have a good chance. Yes. Uh huh. We were on the way to Parliament and they've just called to cancel. <laughs> Apparently, they're electing a new Speaker of the House of Commons. There are meetings between the parties and no one can see us. No one's available. They've cancelled everything. Vielen Dank und auf Wiedersehen. England will have to wait. It's essential not to miss the meeting with the Germans. The experts have completed their mission and the Ecuadorians are waiting for the verdict. The future success of the project depends on it. Do you think they'll see us tomorrow? Isn't tomorrow the last day, or is it today? Today's the last day. It's terrible. We don't know what time they'll finish. As soon as they call us, we'll go. Let's go, gentlemen.
I'm delighted that we can talk again today about the Yasuni ITT initiative and that the Foreign Affairs Minister is here for the occasion. We are seeking to promote a society that is respectful of nature. This oil actually represents 10 days of global consumption. And I think that this effort to reduce pollution in the atmosphere would be beneficial to all. We now have the results of the first studies. I can't yet be very precise, but I want to tell you that all the members of the Bundestag have approved the idea and that we support the project. If I understand your calculations, Ecuador would finance 50% of the net receipts. It is prepared to pay that. And the international community would finance the remaining 50%. I think that's a better, simpler plan, which we can talk about at world level. We will do that, and we will be your partner. For the first time, Rock feels that the dream might become reality. Things start to move faster. The German cooperation minister is ready to see them. In the car on the way to the ministry, they revised the last few details of a financing plan finished off the previous night. I've calculated year by year, country by country. First we have the USA, between 200 and 300 million. Next is Japan, between 50 and 70 million. Then it goes down. Then you have France, England, between 22 and 33. How much for Australia? 2.1. Excellent. Seven for Holland and Belgium, 1.1. I've been listening to you for an hour and a half and I don't understand a thing. You don't understand? <laughs> That's normal. You have to have done a course in Buddhist philosophy. The German minister who had judged their project harshly one year earlier offers them a grant of 500 million euros, a much higher figure than Rock and Carlos had anticipated. With a partner like Germany, the Ecuadorians are credible. Its financial support has a snowball effect. Spain commits 200 million, Belgium 110. Sweden and France say they will contribute, but don't give a figure. It might be a model that can be used uh, worldwide or, or at least for many other countries. So our interest is not only Ecuador, but the, but the planet mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. Ecuador has big ideas and wants to form a group of developing countries who will not exploit their resources in order to protect biodiversity. If the international community was to accept, it would be the most important carbon sequestration ever undertaken. While he had remained in the background, the president himself takes charge of the initiative's media launch a few weeks before Copenhagen. In fact, the protection of nature could be the very purpose of economic production. The developed countries are indebted to the countries that generate environmental benefits, especially as it is the developed countries that have damaged the planet in pursuit of the living standards they have today. Now they depend on the natural capital of developing countries, in this case the countries of the Amazon, to survive. there's just one more leg to go for the Yasuni ITT initiative to become reality. The creation of the fund to control the financial contributions. This last stage is played out in Copenhagen. You must commit. You must deliver now. She's right. It's sad to say that if the result of Copenhagen is bad, it could mean Yasuni is more successful. 
because it's something practical that can bring results in the short term. But that shouldn't be the equation. The equation should be that Copenhagen is a success, and so is Yasuni. In the middle of the stalemate, the Ecuadorian project advances. The UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, has agreed to manage the fund. The Yusuni team achieves a great victory in Copenhagen. Three years earlier, no one was taking them seriously. I'm sure this project will work. I'm convinced of it, because it's a project which has arrived at the right moment. It's a project that resolves fundamental problems, and above all, it has great ethical power. We must leave a space for the administrator. It is very appropriate that the Sunni Trust Fund's establishment is being announced here at COP15. It's absolutely an historical day, and uh, at UN Development uh, Programme, we came in to work with Ecuador on this when others said, this is impossible. But uh, with uh, the goodwill of countries prepared to contribute to this, with Ecuador's determination that it will look after this biosphere, uh, with its concern for the indigenous people, we've got a very exciting outcome. With its setbacks and advances, with its contradictions, Ecuador is beating a new path. If it succeeds, if this idea that's so simple and yet so difficult to realize comes about, Ecuador will be the pioneer that leads the planet into the post-oil era.